Hey everyone, this is Nick and welcome to your weekly Linux and open source news video brought to you by my overstuffed RSS reader. This time we learned that Microsoft has multiple Linux distros in the works, although they are for internal use only. Budgie is being pushed to Fedora's official repositories to provide a default Budgie experience for the distro and we have some massive funding for some open source project. Of course, there are also the enormous releases that are Inkscape 1.2 and only Office 7.1, as well as updates on GNOME and KDE and some good and bad Linux gaming news. What's really good though is this study on the state of Linux security that you can get for free thanks to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare, but this time I'm not going to talk to you about their services to handle and manage your Linux server fleet. This time they want you to take a look at a report that they sponsored about Linux security best practices. This research was conducted by the independent Ponemon Institute and the results which are freely downloadable will let you benchmark your processes against a set of best practices. For example, research shows that organizations spend about 1,075 man hours monitoring and patching systems each week, including 340 hours of downtime to apply those patches. 45% of respondents also indicated that their organization has no tolerance for system patching downtime. Of course, that's a problem that Tuxcare solves with their live patching services, but if you want to learn more about Linux security best practices, how to implement them in your organization, head over to the link in the description below and download the full report for free. No strings attached. The GNOME developers have some new updates to share not only on their apps, but also on the governance of the GNOME Foundation. They have outlined three initiatives they want to focus on. Making newcomers more welcome by employing paid contributors to polish the documentation, adding payment support to FlatHub to help compensate developers for their work, probably in a pay-what-you-want model like what Elementary OS does, and making GNOME a local-first platform to reduce cloud dependency. GTK4 also got some performance improvements to the scrolling in list and column views, and there's a fix to avoid FPS drops when opening pop-up menus. GNOME Software now has basic web app support. Our note, the handwritten note-taking app, now supports more shape types and handwriting should have less latency. Warp, an app to let you transfer files to a specific device with a word-based code, also saw its first release. And Workbench, the sandbox to test GNOME technologies, now supports Blueprint, a markup language, and Vala. I'm interested to see if these three new initiatives will actually bring more developers and so more users to the GNOME platform, as GNOME is already one of the most used desktop environments being shipped on most of the major distros out of the box. It's also the only one with a super solid and stable platform for developers, so it's going to be interesting to see if this provides any benefits and if this drags more people in. Microsoft already had a Linux distribution, designed for internal use only, called CBL Mariner, for common base Linux, and it's used in the Windows subsystem for Linux, Azure, and other Microsoft products. But it seems that Microsoft has another Linux distro out there, called CBLD, for common base Linux, Delridge. It's been published at the same time as their regular CBL distro in 2020, with one main difference where Mariner is a Linux from scratch distro, not using a specific base, Delridge is using Debian at its core. It powers Azure's Cloud Shell, which is Microsoft's set of management tools packaged in a container. Even though Delridge is based on Debian, Microsoft compiles all packages for it themselves to guard against supply chain attacks. For now, both Mariner and Delridge seem limited to internal Microsoft use only. Which makes me wonder, do they actually share the code for these distros? Because since they're using GPL components, they should have to share every modification that they brought. So unless they only repackage stuff without changing anything, then this code should be public, right? Still, it's not the Windows powered by a Linux kernel system that everybody wants to see, except me, because I don't think it would be interesting or I don't think it's ever going to happen. The Open3D Foundation, which manages the Open3D engine, initially donated by Amazon, announced a new big release. Improvements include better stability, installer validation, motion matching updates, automated testing improvements, and support for user-defined properties for the asset pipeline. All things that completely escape my understanding. 
They plan to have two releases per year, with the next being in October. The Foundation also announced a new conference, taking place in October in Austin, Texas, United States, Earth, and they are looking for people to host talks. If you're interested, you can submit a proposal. The conference will also be available virtually for people who can't or don't want to go to Texas. It's taking a bit of time to actually get going, but I'm still pretty excited about this open source 3D engine. If the community rallies around it and supports it well, it could be a very solid foundation to make games that run on Linux and other platforms and run well. Google announced Flutter 3, a cross-platform software framework that notoriously has the support of Ubuntu, which is planning to use it for their new installer and firmware manager. macOS and Linux support were previously in beta, well now it's full stable support for our platform, which is cool. Canonical collaborated with Google to get it to that point, and Linux-specific packages will provide APIs for core systems like Dbus, G-Settings, Network Manager, Bluetooth and notifications. It will also include a complete widget and theme set for Yaru, the Ubuntu theme. The goal seems to be to offer a highly integrated option for development, and I wouldn't be surprised if Ubuntu decided to develop more desktop apps using it, to reduce their dependency on GNOME, which they seem to butt heads with these days. Personally, I will always favor an app that looks native to my desktop to a web app, so if Flutter can actually bridge the gap between native-looking apps and apps that are as easy to develop as web apps, then I'm all for it. We'll have to see if anybody makes something out of Flutter, because for now it hasn't really materialized yet. Joshua Strobel, one of the main Budgie developers, has now submitted Budgie for inclusion in Fedora. The goal is to put the Budgie desktop and all its software in the Fedora repos for Fedora 37, with a backport for Fedora 36. This includes the Budgie Control Center, Budgie Screensaver, and Budgie Desktop View, on top of its default applets, the Raven panel, and every other goodness this desktop brings. This inclusion would come with official support, as Joshua Strobel used Fedora on his laptop and will move his desktop to Silverbloom. He also encouraged people to introduce a Fedora Budgie spin, to let users get Budgie out of the box on Fedora's base. This would be a minimal spin with a few select defaults for Budgie to provide a stock experience with the Materia GTK theme and the Papyrus icon theme. I hope this call for inclusion goes through as it would be pretty cool to have a distro that ships stock default Budgie, which apparently Solus doesn't. KDE developers also have been hard at work with a new weekly update. Two 15-minute bugs have been solved, so the first experience with KDE should be better for everyone. Eliza, the music player, is now able to display lyrics embedded in files using the AllRC format and will automatically scroll those lyrics as the song plays, so you can use KDE for your karaoke parties. There is now a visible option to control tablet mode to let you switch it on automatically or toggle it on and off manually. The system monitor can also make its pages load as soon as the app is open and not when you switch to that specific page, so the app will feel more responsive. The login manager will now shake when you enter incorrect credentials. Tabs in GTK using the Breeze theme will now look like normal KDE tabs. Menu bars will now use the correct color for headers that the color scheme specifies. Text alignment has been improved in buttons without icons. And touchscreen gestures are now one-to-one -one as well on Wayland. A bunch of good stuff that will also land in Plasma 5.25, and this release is looking more and more packed with amazing new features and fixes. I just can't wait to get my hands on it, and of course you can expect a video about it. You might have heard of Rocky Linux, the Linux distro that aims to pick up the slack from CentOS after the move to CentOS Stream. Seems like this rebuild of CentOS is getting massive funding, $26 million to be precise. The distro was kicked off by Greg Kortzer, one of CentOS's founders, and it's serviced by a company called CIQ, which sells support for Rocky Linux. CIQ landed $26 million in Series A funding after a massive adoption from the community. The distro now reaches 250,000 monthly downloads and up to 750,000 downloads in the best month. They already have 10,000 developers and contributors interested, which is even too much for such a young project. The project even gained support from Greg Koa Hartman, the maintainer for the Linux kernel, to try and work on an optional optimized kernel for it. 
It's always awesome to see open source projects just taking off like this. And it's also a nice reminder that there is money to be made in the open source space, at least on the server side of things. Only Office, the open source Office suite for Linux, but also available on Windows and Mac OS, has a new release out. Version 7.1 has performance improvements, especially noticeable on big documents, thanks to improvements to the JavaScript engine they use, as the desktop app is mostly a web app. There are also now print previews in spreadsheets, which is pretty useful, a new viewer for PDF files, the ability to convert PDF documents to docx, the addition of the view tab in the ribbon on text documents and presentations, so you get more options to change how your work is displayed, there's improved handling of shapes, the ability to open smart art objects, and support for new chart types. It is a huge update, and it's still not on FlatHub as I'm recording this video, but if you're using OnlyOffice, that's definitely something that you'll want to update to soon. As a reminder, OnlyOffice is also a sponsor for some videos on the channel, although not for this one. Inkscape 1.2 has been released, and it's a huge update to the open source vector drawing app. Documents now support multiple pages, and there's a new page manager to let you interact with these. Name them, arrange them, or save them as a multi-page PDF document which you can also now import in Inkscape now. The color palette tool can now be customized with changing its size, the colors, and scrolling through available palettes. The objects and layer dialogues have been merged to simplify the workflow and quickly see which object is on which layer. There's a new tiling live path effect to let you create grids and patterns with multiple options to change how that pattern looks. And snapping on the canvas is now much easier with new options in the preferences. Finally, you get a new gradient editor, editable markers for your lines, and a batch export option to let you export multiple objects as individual files, extremely useful for icon makers. Inkscape is just getting better and better, and with the addition of these tools, there is just one more reason to try it out. Google announced a new initiative to try and make sure the open source software supply chain is as secure as possible. They will now curate and distribute a collection of open source packages that they have vetted for security issues. These will be available to Google Cloud customers. It's called Assured Open Source Software, and it aims to bring an answer to the recent issues with major open source pieces of software like Log4j or the intentional self-sabotage of various libraries. There's currently 550 packages. The full list is available on GitHub. And the service is in early access, with general availability planned for the third quarter of 2022. Google also recently announced the formation of an open source maintenance crew to work with the maintainers of various popular open source libraries and help them improve security. Security has long been one of the major selling points for open source software, so it's good to see that reputation getting some help to be restored, even though it's Google doing it. Heroic, the amazing app to let you handle all your Epic and GOG games like you would with Steam and Steam Play, has a new update. First, the app supports themes with a variety of color schemes, including Dracula and a bunch of others. Heroic also now lets you install the Windows version of a game from GOG if you prefer, or if that version runs better with Proton, as often happens. If you use the app image version, it will now auto-update. Heroic also lets you add games as favorites, although I couldn't see any specific use for that, as the UI doesn't let me filter them specifically, and there isn't a sidebar option to only view favorites. You can also now hide games from your library. There are some new accessibility options to change fonts and make the interface bigger, useful for people with disabilities, or on smaller screens like the Steam Deck. And you'll now see how much space is left on a device when installing a game. Heroic is a fantastic program that I use to handle all the free games that Epic throws at me every month. I must say I really prefer it to the implementation of the Epic Game Support thingy in Lutris, as you don't need to have the official Epic Game Store client installed. You can just run your games from Heroic, just works better. The Steam Deck keeps getting more and more titles, as the number of officially playable titles reaches 2,900 including 1,478 games marked as certified and 1,424 titles listed as playable. There are some big hitters added to the list this time, like Days Gone, Anachronox, Half-Life Opposing Force, Ghostwire Tokyo, Chrono Cross, 
Star Wars Squadron, Far Cry 3 and 4, or Dying Light 2. In other good news, Gamescope, the window manager for SteamOS, now supports NVIDIA image scaling, so games will be able to use either FSR or the NVIDIA equivalent. Note that it is not DLSS, as the two seems like different implementations of image scaling. Don't ask me the difference between the two. Finally, less good news, as Fall Guys is now an epic exclusive and will leave Steam, just as Rocket League did before. On June 21st, new players will have to get the game on Epic, but existing players will still get to play their game on Steam and get updates. Right now, Fall Guys can be made to work on Linux by moving its easy anti-cheat file around, but there is no guarantee that this will still work on the Epic version. Kind of a sucky move, but hey, what can you expect from Epic Games, right? Mesa 22.1, the open source graphics stack for Intel and AMD GPUs has been released and it's got a lot of improvements. First, it supports Intel's new Alchemist platform for their dedicated GPUs. It supports the newest versions of various graphics APIs like Vulkan and OpenGL, and it has the copper interface for Zinc to run OpenGL apps on devices that only support Vulkan. On top of that, there are bug fixes for various games like Elden Ring, Apex Legends, Grid Autosport, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance, Rage 2, The Evil Within 2, Ghostwire Tokyo or Age of Empires 4. It's still a development release, so if you want stability, you might want to wait a few weeks, but if not, I'm sure you'll find it in various PPAs or the AUR. It's amazing how many ways we have to fix issues in games nowadays, in Proton, in Vulkan extensions, in the Mesa drivers or in the Nvidia drivers. It still feels like magic. Just like the devices that today's sponsor makes. You probably all have heard about Tuxedo. They're a company based in Germany. They make laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. They have a huge range of devices that you can all configure to your heart's content. From the smallest Ultrabooks, to a giant gaming PC, to a gaming laptop, to a NUC. You can basically do anything you want with their devices. They ship worldwide and they have all keyboard configurations that you might want. They recently refreshed their Stellaris 15, which is their high-end production laptop or gaming laptop. I reviewed the previous one, which was already super powerful, had an amazing opto-mechanical keyboard, a great 3K panel, and basically a nice chassis with tons of I.O. and great performance. But now it has even better CPUs and GPUs, and I should receive a review unit very, very soon with my own logo engraved on the back, and I might even end up buying it for my on-the-go video editing needs. So if you need a new Tuxedo device, head over to the link in the description below, click it and find something that you want. Now, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you want to give me all of your hard earned money, you can also click on the super thanks button down there or on the PayPal link in the description or join my Patreon members or my YouTube members both get access to the weekly patron cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!